Well, greetings again, brothers and sisters in Messiah, in Jesus Christ, members of the house of God scattered abroad, regardless of the believing organization, organization you normally attend. Greetings. We are not an organization of man, but the spiritual organism, the body of Christ. Greetings. Are you a para, paracletos, as it's pronounced? Are you a paracletos? I'll bet you lie awake nights thinking about being a real paracletos. <laughs> Believe it or not, our Father has sent his paracletos to us, and we should be experiencing his paracletos. And as I'll show you today, you and I are actually being called to be a type of that paracletos. So what is a paracletos? What does it mean to be a paracletos? I want to explain by, first of all, sharing a story, a part of my life, when someone was a paracletos to me. Then I'll define it. You are being called to be a paracletos. So I hope this message will ring loudly in your heart and strongly in your heart. In December 1982, my wife and I went through a terrifying, very sad experience of finding our new baby boy of a few months old dead on our bed. Any of you who've ever lost a child know that though indeed time does heal, you never ever quite get over it. I've also lost my father, my mother, my grandparents, cousins, uncles, and aunts. <clears throat> One of my adopted brothers just disappeared some years ago. We've never been able to find him. But all of them put together did not come to the feeling of grief and shock we felt when it was our own son. Anyway, our first reaction was to be by ourselves, not to answer the phone, to go nowhere. And so now I, I do understand that feeling when people go through that. Our first feeling was to do nothing, just grieve. The first few hours, the first day. So I actually even had word go out to the church. I was a pastor that we needed some private time, some alone time. You'll often see that in the news when someone, uh, someone's loved one, good or bad, has died. The family's requesting privacy. You'll actually see this happen quite often when people have to first deal with the death of a child, especially even more so than the death of other loved ones. The mother and father in particular should be remembered in these times. So the phone, our phone, didn't ring. Nobody came over after the word went out. But by the next day, I was dying to have some support, uh, some encouragement and love from my brothers and sisters in the father's house. But I had told everyone to leave us alone. So the phone did not ring. Nobody did come over except one or two when it first happened. Anyway, the next morning I called a fellow minister friend of ours who lived four hours away in Canada. He hadn't heard about the death of my son. It was news to him. He asked, would you like us to come over, Philip? I readily said, yeah, yes, we would. In less than four hours. Remember, he's four hours away. In less than four hours, he and his wife were knocking at our door. All I could figure is that they must have left immediately, picked up just a few things, jumped in their van, and immediately left. I needed someone. My wife and I needed someone alongside of us. We felt like a ship that had gone out of commission, shipwrecked a dead motor, or a sailboat with no wind, broken mast, and in trouble. And in such a situation, it'd be nice to have another strong ship that comes alongside and helps, maybe takes you aboard their healthy ship and provide you, for their, and provide you with your needs. I can think of when the Titanic sank. Another ship, the Carpathia, tried to get there as quickly as possible. They came alongside to the area where the Titanic had sunk, and they were too late, as you know the story. But they were able to at least save the people in the lifeboats. Imagine if Carpathia had not gotten the message. Even the people in the lifeboats would have eventually died. It was very cold. Though they were late, I'm sure the people in the lifeboats were happy to see another ship coming alongside to rescue them. At that moment, we felt hopeless, sad, helpless, going back to the story of my, my wife and I and our son. 
badly needed help uh, to get through this. We needed a comforter. We needed someone to come alongside. We needed a friend. We needed a helper. <clears throat> yes, I know. The Holy Spirit should have been all of that and was there. Our Father in Heaven was certainly with us. But even the most believing saint in one of those lifeboats from the Titanic would have been relieved to have seen a ship come alongside. That's why I'm so amazed when I see the examples in Scripture of how some people are spiritual forefathers coped in certain situations. I always think of the one of Paul and Silas in the, in the jail, beaten, wounds opened, tied down to a stinking, smelly dungeon. And in their pain at that midnight hour, they began to sing. And they began to praise. I wasn't ready to sing and praise. When it first happened, I did. I did get on my knees. And I did say, I guess now I'm supposed to thank you and praise you in this. I said, but Father, it is so hard. So we needed someone who would come alongside in the time of need. That kind of person in the Greek, was a parakletos, or in English religious usage, not everyday common parlance, a paraclete. I'm saying in this message today, think about being a parakletos, not just receiving God's parakletos, but being a parakletos to someone who would come, uh, who could really use someone coming alongside. When was the last time you did that for someone? We'll be talking about that today. The opportunity may be staring you just a few feet away. In the ancient Greek world, I'm told that a vessel was out of, uh, that when a vessel was out of commission and was listless in the water, they had specific ships that were called paracletal ships that would go to the rescue, go alongside the listless one, the shipwrecked one, help it get back to shore or save the, the, the people on board. They'd at least save the people on board the disabled ship. That was a welcome sight, that Paracleto ship. Back in those days, they didn't have radio, internet, satellite. Sometimes it was even impossible to let other ships know you were in an SOS situation, but they could signal by fire, I suppose, or light or some other method. But usually when your ship was disabled, you were, you were a goner. And, and so imagine the depression and the sadness that would be and the worry that would be among the crew. Even today, this may surprise you. You can check it out. I watched a documentary on TV about it recently. 100 to 200 merchant, sh merchant, merchant ships every single year, 1 to 200, just plain disappear on the high seas. It amazes me that we don't see that in the news more. We know now there are 90-foot waves that can suddenly appear in the middle of the ocean and sink even modern warships, cut them in half. The salt water dis disables all the electronics. Communications becomes impossible. I watched a recent documentary on TV on it. You can Google this and check it out, I'm sure. I'll say again, every year, 100 to 200 merchant ships just plain vanish. Imagine what it had been like hundreds of years ago if you were a small sailing ship caught smack dab in the crosshairs of a level 5 hurricane headed straight for you. How nice it would have been to have been a ship later on coming alongside and saving the surviving sailors, if any had survived. A Paracletal ship was one who would comfort the discouraged sailors, feed them, refresh them, for many days may have passed since they'd last eaten. Now some of you, if you turn now to John 14, verses 15 to 18, some of you will immediately recognize that word or name, Paracletos, as something our Savior said he would send after his departure back to the Father's throne in heaven. Let's read this. John 14, verses 15 to 18. Keep in mind that in the, in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures prior to uh, the coming of the Son of God, the Almighty God was known as Almighty God, as Yahweh, the Eternal. And then He sent His Son, Yeshua, salvation. And we had that relationship. 
And now he's saying that when the Son leaves, he is not leaving us. John 14, verses 15 to 18. And I think we all have to learn how to use this paracletos a lot better than we have been. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 16 now. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another paracletos in the Greek. Another helper, another comforter in King James. That he or it, he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. He's right here working. When I work with people who are coming to baptism, I say even now the spirit of God, the spirit of Yahweh is working with you. It's dwelling with you and will be in you. And this is the verse where you find this. And I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. How is he going to come to us? By the Holy Spirit that will indwell us, making us a temple, a temple of the very presence of Yahweh, the very presence of the eternal God. The King James translation for the Greek word parakletos is comforter. Parakletos includes the concept of a comforter, certainly, but it's much broader than that. New King James says, helper. That word parakletos is used only five times in the scriptures and is used mostly in reference to the Holy Spirit, but also is the same word used in 1 John 2, 1, where we have our Savior being called an advocate. The word there for advocate is also parakletos, someone who comes alongside when you're about to get screwed in court, when you're about to get nailed by the prosecuting attorney comes alongside and is your advocate, defends you, sometimes even when you, yes, you were guilty of those things. The defense attorney, how many times have you and I not wondered, how could someone even ever defend that person? Well, there are times that that person is you and I, is you and I. We were guilty of the things we're being accused for. But he will come and be our advocate. And so he says in the, in the Amplified Bible, I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and someone standing by. That's how the Amplified Bible says that one word, parakletos. Let me read some of that again. That's pretty cool. Um, John, four, John 14 16, comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and stand by. Verse 18, I will not leave you orphans, comfortless, desolate, bereaved, forlorn, and helpless. I will come back to you. Excuse me. Now, so parakletos means a lot more than just comforter. Is the concept of being a parakletos to be limited to the Spirit of God and to the Son of God? And I said that it was used, that word is used only five times, always by the Apostle John. Five times. Five is the number of grace. Five times. Keep that in mind. Is the concept of being a parakletos to be limited to the Son of God? Or are we not also children of God? Are we not supposed to be growing to look more and more like the very image of the Messiah? More today than yesterday, more tomorrow than today. Are we not to be exhibiting the life of the resurrected Jesus of Nazareth in our day-to-day lives? Are we not supposed to be exhibiting the fruit of having the spirit of parakletos attitude inside of us? Well... My question really is, we not only are to become, are we not also to become a parakletos ourselves? Surely each of us is to grow more and more into becoming an encourager, a comforter, advocate, and helper of those needing that help. I want to say also that I saw a good blog on this subject from a man named Lenny Caccio, who does a blog, a short blog each Sabbath. You might want to catch him. He's a good man in our master service. So I'm going to explain that Father above has given us his parakletos too, his come alongside a comforter. Uh, remember the ships that would come alongside. They were called parakletos ships, comforting ships. I, and now he says he's going to send that come alongside. And I'm saying we are to be like a parakletos ship ourselves. 
Uh, we are to be like an advocate. We are to be letting the Holy Spirit live through us. I mean, who sees the Holy Spirit? They see you. They see me. And if we're letting the Holy Spirit, the paracletos of God, flow, then other people will see you and me. They will see the Holy Spirit working when they see you and I, when they see you and me working for them. Okay, so I hope you see where I'm coming from on this. Paracletos, P-A-R-A-K-E-L, I'm sorry, K, let me start over, P-A-R-A-K-L-E-T-O-S, P-A-R-A-K-L-E-T-O-S, Paracletos, an intercessor, counselor, according to Vine's Expository Dictionary, refers to the Holy Spirit, the word, the word literally means, the word literally means called to one side for help. That's from Vine's Expository Dictionary, called to one side for help. The translation comforter covers part of that, but it's much more than just comforting. So what the Father says about much of the paracletos, what would Father say about how much of a paracletos you and I have been? I mean, to each other, to our loved ones, to others in the body. How about those who have no advocate uh, who've been disowned by certain groups. I want you to read my blog that I'm putting on the website titled, You Can't, You're Not Allowed to Decide, You're Not Allowed to Choose Who is in God's Family. It's not up to us to decide who is in God's family. Read that blog. It's not very long. And it goes along with what I'm saying here. <clears throat> Sometimes when someone is really down or having a series of tough things happening in their lives, they're frankly not very much fun to be around, and so it's not very much fun to be a paracletos to those people. It's a known fact that once a person's confined to a nursing home, an environment most of us don't really enjoy being in, that that person's loved ones seldom come, in, come visit anymore. They might come once a week or once a month or two or three times a year. It's also a known fact. Women get MS far more than men do. It's a known fact that almost half of the husbands leave their wives who have been diagnosed with MS within a relatively short time of the diagnosis. That's what I mean by sometimes the opportunity to be a paracletos is just maybe feet away. Sometimes it's our very own wife or husband. I preach to myself. It's not easy to be a paracletos to someone else in pain, physically or emotionally. I've been that person, hard to be around at times. I've needed someone to be a paracletos to me at times. And I've also been the person watching others who needed someone to be a paracletos, to stand up for them, to stand by them, to, to share with them. So, guess what? When you're down and out, it's especially when we pray for a paracletos to show up in our life, even though we're not any fun to be around, but we're all each to, called to be one of those. Let's turn now to Luke 14. I want to ask you, how can we make this practical in our lives? How do we make it practical? Who do we invite, for example, over for the special after-Sabbath dinners and fun nights that we have? Who do we want to have around? The person who is in a wheelchair or been told he has just a few months to live with cancer or is blind or, you know, let's be honest with ourselves. I'll admit it. Who do we want to be around for a Super Bowl party? I've been on both sides of this equation at times in my life. And I know there are people out there crying out for someone to care enough to call them, email them, ask to be their Facebook friend or, you know, someone who will initiate that. I know how many times I've been amazed when people have asked me to be their Facebook friend. And, it, and sometimes I'm touched by it. Other times I don't know even know who the person is. <laughs> but uh, most of the time, if it's someone I know, and I think, wow, they want me to be their friend. And I haven't even thought about that person for a long time. Amazing. Um, and you know how it feels when you ask someone to be your friend on Facebook or something like that, and they don't respond. <laughs> and I've been that as well. Um, anyway, so let's see what Master tells us in Luke 14, verses 12 to 14. 
And then he also said to him who invited him, Jesus is sitting at dinner here, Yeshua is sitting at dinner. His name in Hebrew is Yeshua. And when you give a dinner or supper, do not ask your friends. Do not ask your friends. I'm hoping he means don't just ask your friends. (laughs) Oh, dear. Do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. I will say those rich neighbors probably at times need need a paracletos, need someone inviting them as well. But he's saying, hey, they're the ones who are always being invited because they bring a lot of uh, goodies and booze with them and, and, uh, and, and good times, good food and so on. But when you give a feast, make sure, he's saying, that you invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Every time you do that, you might feel like sometimes, well, what's the use, especially if that person that you invited ends up being kind of a uh, not-so-fun person. How many times have you tried to do something good for somebody like that and they end up not really, um, they haven't really uh, responded back. They haven't uh, shown any any desire to show appreciation for it or whatever. And in our carnality, we can start thinking, well, fooey on you. And that's so wrong. That's so wrong. Um, one paraphrase says, invite some people who never get invited out. The misfits from the wrong side of the tracks. That's how it defines that one area there. So he, this, this, this is the message I'm reading. Then he turned to the host. The next time you put on a dinner, don't just invite your friends and family and rich neighbors, the kind of people who will return the favor. Invite some people who never get invited out, the misfits from the wrong side of the tracks. You'll be and experience a blessing. They won't be able to return the favor, but the favor will be returned. Oh, how it will be returned at the resurrection of God's people. Luke 14, 12 to 14 is what I just read you. So how are we doing so far? Myself? Guilty. I don't know if I'd even rate the C. I have invited the poor, but the maimed, the blame, the blind? Well, I'm helping organize our first college reunion from our class in 36 years, and we have a couple of ladies in wheelchairs from our class I think we must do all in our power to make sure they can come, if they can come, according to my boss and my king, my father and my Paracletos. I don't think he's saying never to invite friends or relatives. He's saying don't forget those who aren't relatives and friends, who are alone, who aren't particularly wonderfully fun people to be around, maybe the elderly. I mean, you invite the, we've invited elderly people and, uh, during the fun times, they're sound asleep in the corner. <laughs> so you can you can think, well, uh, do we do that again? Yeah, do that again. I think they'll appreciate that. And when you get old in your 80s and 90s, you might very well, if you live that long, you might yourself be asleep when everyone else is still partying. So let's be a paracletos. Guess what? You yourself are to be that person. Now, Matthew 22:10. I mean, the person who wasn't so uh, such the life of the party, the lame, the blind, and the misfit. In Matthew 22:10, in the story of the uh, king putting on a wedding supper for his son, Master teaches us that, in fact, you and I, if we're going to be there probably, are among the poor, the lame, and the blind, in his eyes at least, who are being invited now to the marriage supper because 1 Corinthians 1:26 verifies that God calls the weak of the world, you and I. And those who were first invited didn't respond. And so Father says, go to the highways and byways and, and, and go ahead, invite the guy in Skid Row. Go ahead, invite the drunks and the bums. Anybody, I want my wedding feast filled. Go back and read Matthew 22.10 if you question what I'm saying. It's right there. And so my point is, Master himself fulfills the very thing. He, he doesn't just preach to us, he fulfills what he himself told us to do. Those are the kinds of people he invited to his banquet, you and I. So the servants went out on the streets, 
and they rounded up everyone they laid eyes on, good, the bad, regardless. And so the banquet was on, and every place was filled. I think that's very telling, isn't it? Master does follow what he teaches. Who did he call as his men who would change the world? He didn't call the high priest or the chief rabbis, except for Paul. Paul was a rabbi. There were some priests who were called that you can read about in Acts 8. But he started with just ordinary fishermen, hated tax collectors, the hated tax collectors and the like. And look what he did in their lives. In the Marines, they have a tradition, Marine Corps, they have a tradition of leaving no one behind. Sometimes I have just logically thought about it, wait a minute, the guy's badly wounded, probably going to die of his wounds, and we're going to risk more people to try to, if nothing else, reclaim his body? That's what they do. Sometimes the brothers in the Marines get wounded because of a stupid thing that one did, in, during the battle, maybe he raised his head when he shouldn't have. Maybe he went out to a place he shouldn't have. But in the Marines, the others will risk their own lives to bring back their comrade back to safety. safety. No one left behind. Semper fidelis, always faithful, always there. If carnal Marines can do it, how are we doing, body of, body of Christ? How are we doing? Anyway, this is what draws those Marine and other veterans together, a sense of being willing to die for one another, to be an advocate, a parakletos for one another, even when others want to uh, discard a child of God made in his image because he or she is too much trouble, not worth it, not the person to be seen with, not someone who can give you a political advantage, not someone who looks good to hang around after, you've, after it's known they've committed adultery or gotten drunk or are a drunkard or this or that. Throw the bum out. And we forget, yeah, there are times. There are times that we're told in Scriptures to disassociate someone from the body, but those same people are to be comforted and brought back in when they've repented. Second Corinthians follows First Corinthians. Bring the man back in, Paul said, whom I asked you to put out. There are times to put someone out for the good of the body, there are times to cut out the cancer before it spreads. I've had a cancer in my body cut out. I'm glad they did, or else the cancer would spread and destroy the entire body. But in cases of human beings, once the person repents, Second Corinthians says we are to bring him back, lest he be overly discouraged. Spiritually, we so often are willing to let our wounded, spiritually or physically, die on the battlefield. Let it not be so. Now go to the story of the Good Samaritan. And let's look, let's look at that again. Let's go to the story, Luke 10. I think there was a time even our Savior was called Samaritan. I'm not sure, but I wouldn't doubt it that they would call him. That's one of the worst things you could call a Jew would be a Samaritan. Our Savior gave the story of the Good Samaritan. So it'd be like us talking about the good Muslim or the good whatever. You know, we have these stereotypes, and there are good Muslims. There are good, wonderful good Hindus. It's because they're not of our faith, and there are some good Christians, and there are some awful Christians as well who, who take on the name. And so he says, okay, call me a Samaritan if you want to, but let me tell you about a good Samaritan. It was the story of someone who came alongside to help, Luke 10, Turn with me and read it with me. Luke 10, verses 25 to 37. Luke 10, verses 25 to 37. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What's written in the law, in the Torah, in your own law? What does it say? What are you, what, what's your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God, or Yahweh is the original, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've answered rightly. Do this, and you'll live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to, said to Jesus, But who's my neighbor? I'm supposed to love somebody as myself, but who is a neighbor? So Yeshua answers and says, A certain man went down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho, 
and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Whenever we leave spiritual Jerusalem, it's going to be downhill, folks. We're on our way out to the city of God, where he put his name, to the city of destruction, to Jer- Jericho. It wasn't supposed to even be rebuilt. Satan, or Satan, came to, comes to destroy, and so he does get hurt. Probably he shouldn't have been going to Jericho. He was stripped of his dignity, his clothes, and so forth. And we, when we sin, when we leave God's presence, are often stripped of our dignity. Okay, beat as it is, the man's laying there on the, on, the, on the road, robbed and beaten, mugged. By chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Do you know why that might have happened? Well, he, he, had, he had duties, he had responsibilities, he had to get to church. I can't stop for that accident on the side of the road. I have to make it to church. I have the sermonette today, after all. I preach to myself as well as to all of you. And who knows, this priest might have been thinking, maybe he's dead or, or would die soon after I get there. And if I touch a dead body, I'd be unclean and not able to do my responsibilities. So let's not be too hard on the priest, because we've all been there, I think. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, oh, a hated Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him. He came alongside. He was a parakletos, if I can use it that way here. And bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, probably a donkey or a jackass, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Now look what he did. A Samaritan anointed him, bound up his wounds. He didn't leave him half naked, but he brought him in. This was probably the animal beast of burden. might have been a donkey. Um... He was ele- if it was a donkey, in those days, in the, among Jews anyway, kings and priests were the only ones allowed on donkeys in the Old Testament. He set him on, a, if I understand it right, he set him on a donkey, basically saying he seated us on high places and then takes care of us. The Samaritan was elevating this wounded man, treating him like a king, certainly elevating him above him, putting him on the animal while he served him by walking. We forget the part about being a donkey and for kings and priests. Maybe that's going too far. But this part here I'm saying that he lifts him up and he walks, puts the wounded man he doesn't know on a donkey or on some animal. We too are half dead or practically dead in our sins. And when we're, but we're being called to be kings and priests. And he lifts us up. You lift me up. A song, yes, very true. He does. Later on, we lift him up, but sometimes we're so wounded and down, he needs to lift us up. Reminds me, frankly, a lot of Ezekiel 16. Go back some time and read that in Ezekiel 16, where God describes the calling of Israel. He says, I saw you there lying on the side of the road, beaten, bloodied up, almost dead. My heart went out to you, and I picked you up. And I raised you as my own. That's what the Samaritan was doing here. On the next day, verse 35, I'm in Luke 10, verse 35. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii. That's two days' wages, folks. Silver coins that are two days' wages. And he gave them to the innkeeper and said to them, Take care of him. And whatever more you have to spend, when I come again, I will repay you. What is the Samaritan who actually is playing the part of what Yahweh or Yeshua, what Jesus the Christ, does for us? He says to one another, to us here, hey, take care of one another. And you will be repaid in the resurrection of the just. I will pay you more than I, when I come again, I will repay you. He's speaking about himself. And he's also saying, don't worry, I have enough to pay for everything you need, all your debts. God paid for all of our debts spiritually. 
Yahweh doesn't feel we have to pay him back for the gift of salvation or righteousness. He pays it all. We pay it back in the sense of obeying him. We pay it back in the sense of, or not pay it back, but we show appreciation by changing our way of life. But we can't pay it back. We just can't. So which of these, verse 36, which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And so he, the expert in Torah, in the law, couldn't even say the words, the Samaritan. He, the expert in the law, said, he who showed mercy on him. <laughs> he who showed mercy on him. Kind of said it fast and under his breath, probably. He couldn't make himself say the word Samaritans, the hatred that the they were despised so much, just as Yeshua was so despised. And so Yeshua, Jesus said to him, go and do like that Samaritan. Likewise, ouch! Yeshua was basically saying, go be like that Samaritan whom you despise. He's the only one who acted according to the Torah that you espouse, that you teach. He's the only one who loved his neighbor as himself. He's the only one who came alongside in time of need. Who do you know who's left behind? Wounded, lame, too risky to be seen anywhere near with. Get out of your safe foxhole or bunker and go find him or her. The word kindness, mercy in scripture can mean goodwill towards the miserable and afflicted. Kindness sees the need not the mess-up that caused the need. Kindness sees the need for help, not the mess-up that that person did that which caused the problem or the need. We get so judgmental sometimes. I have too. Well, he made his bed, he can lie in it. That sucks and stinks to high heaven. If Yahweh, if our eternal Father in heaven, took that attitude towards me and you, We'd have no chance. We'd have no hope. So you see, because this is the kind of Father and Savior we serve, we, we need to become like that too. We're to be growing in His image. Father and Savior Yeshua, pick us up. Bind our wounds. They find us. Remember the story of the blind man whom He healed, and then later on Yeshua finds out He was thrown out of the synagogue? So what does Jesus do? He goes out and it says, When He had found Him, he was looking for him. He picks us up here, and the story binds our wounds, anoints us with oil, gives us wine and a place to heal, and pays for all of it. We've all messed up. In those times, we can use a kind word, a hug, a phone call, acceptance, friendship, oneness, coming together. I've been on the outside. A lot of it I... No doubt, brought on myself. I made my bed and I'm lying in it. I'm ready to be part of the body. I appreciate those who have reached out. And I, in turn, by that experience, am learning to reach out to others who've also been the rejects and the discards, the wounded on the battlefield. The stupid on the battlefield sometimes. They still need saving. So what a great example Yeshua sets for us. So what are things you can do to become a Paracletos? Pray for the spirit of Paracletos. Pray to become someone who comes alongside. Ask Father to make you and me pliable and compassionate, merciful and non-judgmental. It's the judgmental, he had it coming attitude, or she made her bed, let her lie in it, that keeps us from being a Paracletos. Pray for the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, which was the comforter, the Paracletos. The fruit of Paracletos simply describes Father and the way he is and the way his kingdom functions as members of his kingdom and household Pray he releases the fruit of his Paracletos, of his Holy Spirit, of his coming alongside into your life. Follow the leading of the Spirit. 
When you get an urge to do something, to go alongside someone, do it. Follow the leading of the Spirit. The more we obey, the more we will hear God's voice, the more we'll be in sync with his mind. I pray that we have God's Spirit leading us more and more. And I pray even more that we will recognize it and follow his lead. Here are some practical things that you can maybe be doing. Let's take Mother's Day coming up. Call someone whose kids have died. Maybe a mother who has been abandoned by her kids. That's worse than death sometimes. Or whose kids don't give a hoot. Or whose kids are not nearby. Maybe invite her to come. You know, I remember I met the woman personally going back 20 plus years now. You can probably Google this, but a woman who was sued by her own kids for not being a proper mother to them. I met that woman. She was in upstate New York at the time. And after spending half hour with her, my carnal side said, now I know why they sued you. I mean, she would, you know, I could see reasons why. But she needed some love. And acceptance. She had her own issues. Maybe even on Mother's Day, invite someone to your home for that day. Tell that woman you'd be honored if she could be a mom, an extra mom to you on that day. I've lost my mom. So on Mother's Day, we try to remember moms like that. This year, however, we'll be out of town on Mother's Day. And so we'll have to do it some other day. Someone has quit religion. How about that situation? And won't attend an organization. But you know he or she needs a friend, a brother, a sister. He or she may be wounded. I know some of you won't agree with me, so be it. You go and walk on the other side of the street with a wounded person. And you cross the street like the priest and the Levite. Go ahead. I know what scripture says. I know Jesus sought the healed blind man who had been thrown out of the synagogue because he wouldn't disavow his healer. I mean, the blind man wouldn't disavow his healer. It would not have been politically correct to be seen with this man who had been thrown out of the synagogue. Even his own parents more or less abandoned him because, in essence, they sought the praises of men more than the praises of God, as is described of a different group of people later in John 12 at the end of it. But in John 9, verse 35 to 38, Jesus heard that they had cast him, the healed blind man, who was supposed to, uh, that healing was supposed to be for the glory of God. Go back to verse 1 and 2. How much glory was this? He's being thrown out. And Jesus heard that they would cast him out when he had found him. When he would found him, it means he went looking for someone that you didn't want to be hanging out with according to the synagogue rulers, according to the religious people of the day, Yeshua said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And the blind man answered and said, Who is he, Master, that I may believe in him? Yeshua said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. And then the blind man said, Master, I believe. And he worshipped him. Now, if... Jesus, or Yeshua, wasn't the Son of God on earth, it would have been a terrible sin to let someone worship him. Jesus let him worship him. The one everyone else rejected, who had been blind, was the only one who actually got to see and know who his Redeemer was. To him was revealed the Messiah. We too will see God better when we seek those who have been discarded by church groups and society. The ones who were really blind were those who said they could see, but they missed seeing the Son of God standing in their very midst. In fact, judgment came upon them, for later on in that chapter, end of chapter 9, Jesus said, So therefore, if you claim to see, therefore your sins remain. What a scary thing to hear from the judge. If you were blind, I would have skipped over this, he said earlier, at the end of John 9. But now that you claim to see, your sins remain. 
So be the person. Turn now to Luke 11. Be the person who comes alongside. Be the parakletos. Cross church lines. Have dinners at your home that include people from various church organizations. Be the one who gathers together so you won't be accused of being one who did nothing to stop the division, scattering, and sectarianism. Notice what our Savior says in Luke 11:23. He who is not with me is against me. Right here, he who doesn't gather with me scatters. My question is, what have we done to gather with him, to gather people to him? Or are we going to be considered a scatterer? Why not be where the Messiah is? Where is he? He's gathering together. And he's gathering people who are the discards, the rejects, the blind man thrown out of the synagogue, the, the reviled tax collector. Uh, Zacchaeus was another one, a tax collector. The fishermen who were, who were despised the poor of Galilee. Galilee of the Gentiles. He is gathering together. He is one body. His church is one body. He teaches we are members of him and of one another, Romans 12, 5. He commands us not to have schisms. Are we heeding those commands? Let's read it again in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 to 13. Now I plead with you, brethren, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 to 13. Beg you, he says, plead with you. By the name of our Master, Yeshua the Messiah, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. That's the stated will. Oh, later he says, oh, there must be divisions, so those who are approved can be discerned. But, uh, you know, but the stated will is that there be no divisions among you. Our Savior prayed that in John 17. He prayed that, that these people, Father, would be as one with each other as we are with each other. That these men that I'm sitting here beside who are being called into the body will be so one that they can be said they're as one, that they can say we're one, we're, we're, we're like one body. Just like you and I, Father, can say that we're one being, we're one, not one being so much, but one, we're just one. You in heaven, me on earth, we're so united in concept and thought and unity that we are one. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he's saying these 11 who are left here, let them be so one that they can say we are as one body, all one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in unity and harmony. No, we aren't. Not yet. Verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 1 says, Is Christ divided? Is Messiah divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Why are you talking about these human leaders that you have? I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas or Kepha. I am of Christ. That's nonsense. He's not divided. Yeshua prayed we'd be as one as he and the Father are one. Now, if you haven't heard the series I gave on One Body in late 2009 and early 2010, please do hear that series. I'm talking about this because it's hard to be a gatherer unless you have the spirit of parakletos. It's hard to want to be with those folks over there, quote-unquote, unless we understand we are not to be all split up like we are today. Whatever. Let's start focusing on what we have in common, not the things we have not in common. Whatever, come alongside God's children, regardless of where they are. I can't decide who's going to be in the family of God. God decides that. I can't decide who my brother was. And he couldn't decide who his brother was going to be. God decided. And I was born and my brother had to have me as his brother. And me, him, as a brother. Decide on it's the same way in the in the church in the family of God. I don't get to decide who God calls to be part of that family to bring into His family. I, I can decide to love Him. I can decide to watch in amazement to see how Yeshua is going to reveal Himself in that person's life. So decide on some ways you can gather people together. I'm not talking about starting yet another organization or, or, or sect. Or, I'm not. I'm saying be a gatherer of God's children. Put your mind to it. Share with me some ideas, and I'll share them on the website. We've got to start gathering together. Please turn now to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. 
2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. In fact, Scripture tells us that when we experience the parakletos of God, the comforting, the consoling, the encouragement, the coming alongside of God, the reason we do is to share that same thing with others. We will remember what it was like, and that's why we have so many problems, so that we can identify we have walked in those shoes. In 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4, I'm reading from the ASB, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord. You see, even Christ has a God and Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, or our Master Yeshua the Messiah, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. Sometimes when you're going through a hard time, think of this. Perhaps you're being allowed to go through this so you will be one of those who understands this. And that's why God is calling into his body people from all backgrounds, the wealthy and the poor, the people who have it together and mostly those who don't. He's calling drunks. He's calling sex perverts. He's calling, he's calling alcoholics. He's calling gay people. He's calling people who aren't gay. And yes, there are gay people in the body of Christ. Yes, there are. He's calling every kind of person so that they understand what has to be repented of and overcome. We all have our sins. We all are guilty of the death penalty. We all must show love and compassion. And we all have to understand who's going to understand a drunk but someone who's been a drunk. And on and on with all the examples. I promise you, nobody knows what it's like to lose your own child until you've been through it. It's not the same as losing a parent or something like that. And you don't know what it's like to be told you have cancer and that you have a few months to live unless you've been through it. You don't know what it's like to be thrown out of church unless you've been through it. You don't know what it's like to go through a divorce unless you've been through it. Whatever life is throwing at you unless you've been through it. But maybe, just maybe... As 2 Corinthians 1.4 says, maybe it was allowed in your life for the very reason that you were to be a more effective comforter, parakletos, to others. I know we understand the pain of someone losing their child because we went through it. I know we do. We can let the sore trial make us bitter, and I've been there too. So I can understand those who are being there too. Or we can work through that and let us make it stronger. The Greek word here for comfort that you may comfort them with the comfort you receive. Okay, the word there for comfort is not exactly parakletos, but it's parakaleo, a similar word with similar meaning. Parakaleo means to beseech. It's a verb. The noun is parakletos, be a parakletos. Parakaleo is to comfort. It's, it's uh, the same. It's, it's the verb form of parakletos. Parakaleo means to comfort. Very similar to the concept of parakletos, someone coming alongside. I don't typically base my doctrine on the Bible uh, uh, paraphrase called the message because it's too much of a paraphrase. I like to see what the original writer said. But in this particular passage, I think the message paraphrase really captures the meaning of this particular message. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, I'm reading from the message. All praise to the God and Father of our Master, Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel. He comes alongside us. There's your parakaleo, the parakletos. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. Be less a judge and more a parakletos. Be a comforter, a person who comes alongside when someone needs you. Be the helper, the advocate for those who've been abandoned. Stand up for them, even though they may have done some wrong, especially if they're repentant. 
or pray for their repentance. After all, we have King Yeshua as our advocate when we are accused by our adversary. Are there not always times where are there always times we're falsely accused, or are there not times we've given Satan the ammo to use against us? In those times, does our Savior, our ultimate Parakletos, abandon us? No. We're to become more and more like him. Don't abandon people, even those who had it coming to them. Let me tell you something about learning something um, from the experience you've been through. Romans 8.28 is one of my favorite scriptures. All things work together for good to those who love God called according to his or that called according to his purpose. And I've used it so many times, I've preached whole sermons on it in the past. And then our son died. <clears throat> and I must have had a few hundred people use that verse on us. We were standing in line and we even had a man you know, the reception line at the memorial service. And we had a man say to my wife, I was standing beside her, but Mrs. Shields, this is okay, because Jesus said, woe to those who give suck, and we're going to be fleeing soon to a place of safety. So this was a blessing from God. And he kind of gave a little weak smile and shook her hand, and my wife said, thank you. It was all I could do not to deck him. And that was 28 years ago. <clears throat> it was all I could do not to deck him. But anyway, I've learned the feeling of wanting to deck someone. And I've learned also, even Scripture, there are times to say something like that. There are times not to. What we found really most effective was when someone just stood with us. They were just there with us. And so like it says in Second Corinthians 1, what I learned from it was when someone's really grieving, <clears throat> be like our friends four hours away and just be there. Don't say a lot. Don't say anything. Just hug him. Maybe it was worth my son dying to learn that. I don't know if I've learned it yet. There is a time to say Romans 8.28 when they're ready to talk, when they're ready to analyze it if they bring it up. And there are times that we are to encourage each other with the hope of the resurrection. I remember people saying, you're going to see him again. And he'll be well, he'll be healed, he'll be fine. And I remember blurting out to that person one time, but I don't have him now. I don't have him now. And it hurts. And I know I'm going to see him again. And that gives me some comfort. Yes, it does. But <laughs> just be there for me. That's what I really want to say. And maybe different people will respond different ways. You have to have wisdom to look at what a person needs. Anyway, let's let the Holy Spirit stir us to be more like our Father. Let's love those who hate us. Do good to those who hate us. Speak well of those who malign us. Bless those who curse us. Give to those who wish to take from us. Pray for those who wish nothing good for us. In so doing, when we live like this, we are, we are proving that we are children of our Father in heaven, as it says at the end of Matthew 6, when we do those things I just said. Frankly, I needed to study. Most of us can be vengeful if we let that part of our nature win out. We can say, he's had it. He's on his own now. Good riddance. Get out of here. Or we can say, he or she needs prayer, love, and forgiveness. Another chance. I will crawl out of my foxhole, and I will not leave a child of God behind, wounded by the enemy. 
I will be the good Samaritan in her life, in his life. I will let the risen Messiah live again and let him act and live in me as he would if he were here himself. And so by doing, by the way, we are letting the resurrection Jesus, the resurrected Messiah, be evidenced that he is risen because they see such a change in you. I have one more thing to say. When we have a length of chain link, that chain will be only as strong as its weakest link. If you know a link is weak, we would cut it off and then reconnect the rest. But people aren't pieces of metal links that can be cut out of our lives. Our lives. People are potential children of Abba. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters to us. We should be very careful to just cut off a weak human link, a living, breathing human link in the chain that Father brought together. What can we do in the case of a weak link? And quite frankly, at different times in my life, I'm a weak link. And quite frankly, you are a weak link. All through Scripture, we see what he did the story of the prodigal son, the story of the good Samaritan, the story of the lost coin. We see what he says in Ezekiel 16, how he saw us in our own blood, and in his love he said, Live! And he came down from majesty up on high to be where we were, linked himself up to us, and now we're strong, strong not by our own might and effort, but strong by him and in him. And he gave up being very God to be a mere man, and now he can understand what it's like to be a mere ant, so to speak, out here. Can you understand that? I'm sure you can. And so my point, though, is that's what we're being trained to be. That's what we're being trained to be. And what he does when he sees that we are weak links, he comes and comes beside us, now imagine if instead of cutting out the weak human link, we brought the biggest, strongest link possible and linked in with that one. The biggest, strongest one is Yeshua himself. So Paul said, I can do all things through Messiah, through Christ who strengthens me. Stand in the power of his might. I think that's Ephesians 6.10. And the other one was Philippians 4.13. If you want to be strong spiritually, link up with him. And part of the meaning of Elohim, or El, is Eloah, is the strong one. He's also known as the Almighty God, El Shaddai. Imagine El Shaddai taking up the space you once occupied as a weak link in the chain and saying, here, I'm not cutting you out of the link, out of the chain. I'm joining up with you. Because I will never, ever, ever, ever leave you or forsake you. That's in Hebrews, isn't it? Together we'll get through this. And you know what? I know thousands of others who will link up with you and me as well. Ask him to come alongside you and you and Messiah. Now make up that space that you used to be just your own broken shipwrecked life. He came alongside and now together you are raised in him and with him to sit in heavenly places. I've been referring to many, many scriptures in the last 20 sentences or so and I trust many of you are thinking of them as I'm speaking. He linked us up with him. And now we can be as strong as he is if we stay linked in him and use his strength. Be strong in his might. Ephesians 6.10 And the rest of the children of Yahweh see this and they link up with you now too. Now how strong was that once weak link? We crawl out of our foxholes. We bring the guy back who's been shot down. We link up with the weak link. We help the poor wounded soul. And don't cross the street and go the other side just because we have a sermonette scheduled. Turn now to a verse in Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 to 12. Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 to 12. I bet some of you were thinking of this as I was talking about a weak link and all that. Ephesians, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 to 12. Two people are better off than one. Oh my, is that ever true? For they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. 
Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Does that speak to you? I hope so. Who's the weak link that you can think of? Pray for them and then call them, even just to say hello. Sometimes people are moved by the fact someone thought of them. Wow, don't, doesn't take much sometimes. We're all, we all like some validation. Of course, there are more tangible and powerful ways we can help come alongside. Be there in the tough spots of a person's life if you possibly can. I almost always regret it when I can't make a stronger effort to be there in times of duress, stress, times of sadness. And I have made reasons why I can't go. It's too far. I've got work. I, I can't leave work. I can't take off time. I don't have the money for the airfare. Uh, take the time to send at least a condolence card. Take the time to celebrate with someone's joy or mourn with those who mourn, as it says in Romans 12, in whatever way we can. But beware of the opportunities to be the best parakletos you could possibly be will almost always be very inconvenient times for us. <clears throat> people don't die on a convenient schedule according to a convenient time on our calendar they don't get told that they have uh, a stage 3 or 4 melanoma uh, I just talked with someone very dear to me who may have a stage 4 melanoma and uh, he may need some comforting he may need some assuring I may, uh, I, I may need to fly down and be with him they come up suddenly with no warning no time to schedule it I've certainly blown a lot of those times because I had to work or it cost too much money or it wasn't a good time or I had other plans. Some of the biggest regrets are not so much the things I wish I hadn't done, though there are lots of those too, but I regret the things I wish I would have done but didn't. This Paracletos. You know, they have these national, not National Guard, but these guys who are in these uh, helicopters that go out and help the people in shipwrecks and there's a raging sea. Many, many, many of the people saving them have themselves drowned. But they'll jump in the raging water to try to, in freezing water, to try to save someone's life. A paracletos. I regret most the times I could have done something and didn't. Another big point, the biggest opportunities we have to be a paracletos, a person who comes alongside, are often staring us right in the face. These are times we need to forgive your husband or your wife, even though you're mad as hell at them. And I'm saying it that way for effect. You're mad as can be. Okay, I'll be better. You've had a fight. Your spirit tells you she's hurting, though. She needs your assurance of love that you're going to protect her from any more hurt. So, men... Swallow your pride. Go to her in her pain and assure her of your love, that you're her rock. Wives, there are times you need to be the paracletos to your husband. Ask Father to open your eyes and your heart to those times. He may not be feeling like a strong rock all the time. If he's not doing so well in his job, or can't find a job, or providing for you as other men seem to be able to provide for their families, he's likely needing some reassurance that you too, he's, to you too, he's still your hero. He still has your love and respect. He's still giving you everything you need. We men may act tough on the outside. But I know I feel a heavy burden providing for my family and even extended family at times. There are times when husband and wife need to assure each other that they just can't seem to provide, uh, if they just can't seem to provide the emotional or even sexual expectations for each other for various reasons. As we get older, we experience some side effects of medications, hormonal changes, menopause. Many find it harder to be effective in those areas as they were in their 20s. In those times, the opportunity to be a paracletos is right there staring you in the eye. The love of your life needs you. Stand by your woman. 
Stand by your man. The whole point of the sermon is to be more aware of being someone who comes alongside. Let the Spirit let you use your life's experiences to just be there. Don't overplay certain things. It took our son's death for me to learn a lot. It took my a lot of other things I've been through. And I hope I'm growing through it. And that's the point. We're supposed to be growing to it for it so that we become a better Paracletos. Again, one of the big regrets I've had is not being there for people when I could have been. My cousin of just a few years younger than me was killed recently in a violent car accident. I was going to go meet up with him in Reading and do stuff together, but somehow that never happened. My father died suddenly 20-some years ago, but fortunately I did write him the letter I needed to before he died. Don't have regrets. Don't have regrets. The loving things you would say in someone's memorial service, say to them now. The things you would write about them later after they're gone, write to them now. Do you have an aging uncle or aunt who needs to uh, who needs uh, to know that someone thinks of them? Call him up. He's 84, 85, 90. Say hi. Ask, they might even ask you your name two or three times. Ask him or her for stories about your family. They're growing up years. Some Show some interest in them. Validate them. Is there a nephew you have out there struggling with life's issues? Be the uncle or the aunt he needs. Be the parakletos to your loved ones, your cousins, your, your nephews, your nieces. Be the strong link that they might need right now. What am I teaching? I'm teaching be a gatherer of people. Bring people together. Start with your own family, your extended family, your uncles, your aunts, your nephews, your nieces, your grandparents. Don't forget your grandparents and your cousins. Keep in frequent touch with them. Grandmas, grandpas who are aging, make them beam as they hear you are thinking of them. Go by and help them. Go by and see them. If you don't have a grandma or grandpa, adopt one. Lots of them are around you. Young people, I mean anyone under 55 here, don't think you can just email Facebook or Twitter your aging parents or grandparents and get away with that. It's not nearly the same to them as a phone call. Trust me on this. Just because your your friends in your 30s and 40s would prefer a, a Twitter or a, or a text message or, or a Facebook message, don't believe it that that's the same thing for someone in their late 50s or 60s or 70s or 80s. You might think it's just as good, but trust me, the older generation wants and needs the real thing. They want a real phone call at least, a real voice on the other side at least. Hear me on this one. At least once in a while, take the time to make a real phone call and chat with your dad and mom. Emailing all the time just doesn't cut it for some of us. And no, a phone text message, not the same. It's not the same. You know, I, was, I got a text message from somebody one time, and I had to email him back or call him back and say, I have no idea what you're trying to say. It was all in text code. It takes a while to even decipher text the way young folks write them. LOL, F-O-L, L-O-L. I know, what on earth is L-O-L? Until I found that it's supposed to stand for laughing out loud. Or uh, they might say, how are you? Is how, and then the letter R, and the letter U, and then before is B and the and number four. And it irritates some older folks to try to decipher all that. Not all, but enough. So sometimes just write to them in plain English. Call them in plain English. I promise you, you'll start to grow old too. And when you do, it's nice to have the younger part of the family come alongside, assure you that it's okay to remember names like if you don't always remember names like you used to. It's okay that you're losing your hair or aren't as tall as you used to be. It's okay that you're lumpy, saggy, and achy. And I'm just talking about your left leg. <laughs> it's okay. You'll get there too. Really, the sermon's about being a paracletos about being uh, one more often. It's about opening your eyes to the wonder of being out there just when it's most inconvenient but most needful. I've already told you about our friends who dropped everything, drove right up to be with us, and stayed with us for three days after my son died. He and his wife were true paracletos to us at the time. <clears throat> God blessed them for being there right then, immediately. This is all training to be the kind of leaders Father wants us for his kingdom. Leaders just like his son who came to give of himself, to serve and not be served. Leaders who care for those under their care. Those who have no love need not apply for this job. Or ask for an awful lot of it to be given you. And we learn to love by the hardships and the hard times we, we, we've gone through ourselves. 
Leaders who are learning what Peter teaches in 1 Peter 5, to not be as lords over those entrusted to you, but as examples to the flock. May Father's love fill all his children as we practice being a paracletos to one another, someone coming alongside, standing with those who need help, someone being the strong link in their life when they're feeling very, very broken, being the two- or three-strand rope that can't easily be broken, being the paracletos ship, paracletos ship, to someone who's just shipwrecked their life. Being the marine crawling out of his safe bunker or foxhole. To be with the wounded comrade out there in the open. And drag him back to safety. May Father bless you as you practice this incredible gift. We have to help stand with one another and to come together and to gather as one together, all into one body of Messiah. It's time for these divisions and splits and whatever reasons we keep coming up for them, it's time for that to stop and time for the people of God to be parakletos and stand beside each other and link up through the power of the Holy Spirit and show the world what one body of Jesus Christ, of Messiah, can really be like when we really are one body. Be a parakletos. We will not be one body until we learn to be parakletos. Until next time, this is your brother, Philip Shields, in the Messiah, who also needs a parakletos brother or sister in my life from time to time. Thank you for those of you who have been. Amen.